This conference will now be recorded. First, I want to start off by thanking uh, Christy and Josh for being with us and giving um, of, so generously of their time. If any of you have ever um, employed an attorney or retained an attorney, you know these are billable hours for them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we are very fortunate to have an opportunity to sit with them for a bit and get um, some advice from them. I want to uh, to let you all know there is a chat function. I'm going to start high in here so that you see where it is. If you have questions, please go ahead and start loading up that queue. I've got some questions we're going to start off with, but we do want to open. This is an opportunity for you to ask those things you may not have been able to find out through any other source. And don't worry, Christy, I'll read those questions off to you guys. You don't have to, wor to worry about it. I know you're on your phone, so it's probably tiny for you. Um, so I guess let's just start off. If you guys don't mind, I know you have a lot of, of, of clients that are businesses. Um, what are what are some of the biggest issues that you're hearing already from your clients? Well, it it really runs a pretty broad range, and because there's so many pending legal issues in different industries, so each industry is pretty unique. So I say that to say this too. Um, it's 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 going to be a little challenging in order to answer without. Some of these questions are probably going to be questions that we would normally sit with a client and get a lot of facts and a lot of information in order to fully and comprehensively re, 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 re respond. So with the Q&A type of a for, for, format, it's, it's, it's hard. So we're going to answer them based on, you know, the format we've got and the information that we have. But I really encourage people that, you know, if, to, to dig a little, you know, deeper, call your attorney, call us you know, in, in, and make sure that, you know, if there's further facts or information that this format just simply doesn't provide the time in order to do that, that they go beyond just this sort of um, Q&A as, as well too, because these issues are complex. And each industry we're seeing healthcare, for example, has one set of problems often and manufacturing has their own set. And so um, it, it's 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 pretty it's pretty broad ranging. Everything from things like to answer what you're saying, Heather, we're seeing everything from sort of unemployment and layoff type of questions. If you've got a business slow slow down, to um, leave questions. If you do, if you are operating and you've got um, employees that are are sick or loved ones that are sick or children at home to um, the whole CARES Act about what type of, of uh, PPP loans are out there, how does that work, how does that dovetail with the employer tax credits or with the leave credits, that type of thing. Um, I'm seeing a lot of, I have an employee who has been diagnosed or their loved one has been diagnosed. What does OSHA require as far as um sanitizing things and and that that type of thing uh, i've got a lot of i'm um, got my ppp loan and i'm ready to bring some people back to work but they're drawing more on unemployment than they are um if they came back here they don't want to come back to, to work i've offered it to them but they're not coming um well, let's, let's jump off there because that is one question that we have heard quite a bit what uh what 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 is within an employer's power if if they um, scale back up and they they bring their employee they offer their job back to an employee what right does that employer have what are they able to notify the department of labor is that is the employee still eligible to continue to draw that unemployment if their job's been offered to them Go ahead, Josh. Here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question and something we're, that you know that we're we're trying to figure out because especially when you look at while people are drawing on un -M 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 appointment is really a lot more than what they 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 traditionally make anyway. So the fear is is uh, once they start drawing those higher amounts and more than what they 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 normally draw, they're not going to really have much of any incentive that they come back to work once they are ultimately uh, going to be uh, recalled. Uh, so that's a great question. What we have recommended and advised and, and, and advise the clients is that if it comes when it when it comes time to actually uh, to 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 call any 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 worker back, that we notify the state 
let them know that this person has been offered a job and assuming that they turned it down, that, that that also be a part of the notice. And also, I'm, I'm also um, adding to that as well too, that if they wanna send a letter to the employee, this confirms we offered you the job back and you refused that job. And so, and not doing that to be harsh to the employee, but so that you have documentation. So when you look at your numbers for the PPP, so you're not dropping below the 25%, you show what you, you know, that, 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 that the uh, that job what was offered back and it was turned turned down. And so we're, we've got a lot of murky issues. That's, that's the next wave now. We've, we've gone through the wave with, with some, not all, but with the closures, now we're looking at the rehires and all of the, the issues that, that go along with, with, with that. And like with the closures, a lot of these are murky and gray. There's no guidance and we're just giving the best guidance we can until the appropriate governmental agency provides more. I think there's been a lot of confusion about um, travel letters and essential workers. Um, can you give shed a little light on um, if, if a business is open, what an employee needs to have with them, what what rights an employee has to travel, what rights an individual has to travel in the state of Alabama? So when you're looking at a, a worker, if they are an employee at an essential business, they're able to travel into work. The gov uh, Governor Ivey's order, I think of April 6th maybe, uh, is that that's the correct date. States, you don't have to have a letter that in order to, for an essential worker to travel back and forth to, to, to work, they don't have to, to have one, but they, but they can. I've drafted several, I know Josh has two. I, I've yet to have anybody, any, any client say, um, my employee was pulled over or my employee was stopped and I need a letter. It seems to be more of a preventive thing. We haven't seen um, a need for it. And, um, and in fact, the order from KIV says that you, you don't have to have one now, but that's different than what an essential service is for the public. Like for example, uh, an essential service has been defined as a law firm. So, um, so employees could come, come into work and travel back and forth, but we're not considered an essential service for which the public um, can come to us here. So there's a difference between what a worker of an essential service can travel for and what just the general public can come in order to, to come to our, so our office is closed, our front door is locked and closed because to the public, we aren't in the list of food and healthcare and pets and that type of thing. So how are attorneys able to work during this time, especially in situations where you must, you know, you have to have signatures Sometimes you have to have that one-to-one, -one, um, you know, a, a real estate closing. How how are things operating right now? Just having to keep having to keep small groups. Yeah, you know, luckily, I mean, as to uh, law firms and really any 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 smaller business uh, like us, uh, you really as long as you maintain separation, you know, that even though you are essential. I still think that they are requirements, especially under OSHA and, and other guidelines and or regulations that you that you maintain proper sanitation you, and, and try to maintain proper proper distance. As to things that luckily that have been implemented that have that made our jobs easier in terms of some of the technical requirements, I think uh, as to Heather, as to what you as to what you were asking about, is luckily that we can notarize via 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 a, a, a video conference, Zoom, FaceTime, whatever. Uh, the only requirement that we have is that we actually, have, you know, of course, have to video and see the person signing, and then it can be mailed to us, but we have to keep that video for up to, for up to a five-year period. Uh, so that has made it easier. Mm -hmm. The one thing, the challenging thing that we kind of have right now is, 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 is as to real estate closings. Number one, the probate court is presently closed, so as to doing title searches, it's been somewhat of a challenge. But then secondly, they, as to having uh, exceptions made to have uh, someone e-sign a, a loan document mortgage, uh, that there haven't been any, any, any uh, exceptions as to those type of documents yet. So that's been somewhat, somewhat of a challenge. But luckily as to doing wills, uh, just normal contracts, we can still do a lot of that via, via the uh, Zoom and or FaceTime.
And, and we are closing loans here. We've had several real estate closings where we emailed them off, they're signed and dropped off, or that you know, the, so we're we're making it work to the extent that the lender is with the the buyer, the seller, and the lender are willing to work with us. We're we're making it work because we can notarize. By, by, by email and that was hugely helpful not email excuse me by video chat that's a big help so we've we've been signing wills um people seem to be in the mood to get their wills done in this day and age so we've got a lot of people that want to 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 do 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 that so we're uh able, have to jump through some more hoops but so far there's nothing that's needed that the client that has needed to get done that we haven't been able to find a way well, better to see an uptick in, in people preparing with wills than an uptick in divorces when we're all home. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, another question that we've, we've received a lot uh, revolves around uh, rentals and evictions. And we've kind of had the question on both sides. Um, landlords who are concerned about um, their rental income coming in and then businesses that are concerned about their inability to pay while they're waiting on a PPP loan or they have no income coming in. Um, I, I was just curious what you know what do you what would you suggest to each on on each side? So you've got God there's a lot of facets to that. So you've got the Governor Ivy's order which people are have a, a misunderstanding that they think that it stops evictions totally. It, it does, it stops the enforcement of any eviction order, okay? And so, but the court has basically slowed down on even proceeding with those, but the you can still technically begin the court procedures to evict somebody. It's just Governor Ivey's office doesn't let the sheriff's office enforce any of those orders. Evictions are completely stayed though from a federal level on any federal, um, housing, any, any housing or any mortgage or anything like that that's gotten any federal funds, everything is, 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 is at stake. So from a residential point of view, well, from a commercial point, I'm seeing a lot of my business, my landlord clients, where they have commercial property getting letters from their you know, tenants that say, look, we need to abate rent for the next three months. We'll you know, we'll, you know, wrap it up into equal payments starting in October or starting at the beginning of the year. And and I see a lot of landlords and tenants from commercial property working because it's technically an event of default for the tenant to not pay the rent under the lease, but mostly landlords are, are working with them. Tenants are coming up with alternative ways. They're they're limiting their the scope of their request, not just I'm not paying rent, but I won't pay it for these three months and then I'll start repaying that as part of my rent at some future date. So far, most people have been able to, to, to work things out. We, we haven't really seen, I haven't really seen a huge influx of residential evictions of landlords coming in. It's most landlords appear to be working with their tenants in order to either extend the payment terms or put it, put it a year down the road or, or, or make it, make it, uh, you know, work. But technically many of those, unless they're, uh, a certain kind or are, are it would be a default of of the lease but most most parties are are working with each other and, and also adding to that i would i would think the courts first of all we're, we're somewhat delayed in getting mm -hmm. getting re getting any any relief from from any court i had a hearing that's scheduled i think on may 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 11th and i just talked to uh, a judge this morning, and and he and that he's going to postpone that hearing because of it. So, I would recommend you know to have some degree of reasonableness. Uh, sometimes a bird in the hand is better than two in in uh, in uh, the bush. So, uh, assuming that you can work out some type of reasonable uh, resolution where you're getting some money, getting some some form of promise and or satisfaction, that might be a better alternative right now. Just a simple written agreement between the two suffice. It yes. would, yeah. Usually, a, um, a, a amendment to the lease is like a, we've seen like a one page. We've kind of worked up in a, a one page amendment that says, "Hey, we abate rent March, April, May. We wrap that up into six equal payments starting in October." Yeah, simple one one page thing. It's it, yeah, that's what we're seeing. So I want to remind all of the participants again. Please feel free to enter any questions you have in the chat function. I know we do have couple of people that called in. Um, if, if you've got a question that you're wanting to ask and you can't, um, you're not on the 
the webinar, you're just on the call. I do have everyone muted. You can unmute yourself to ask a question. This is an open forum. It's not just my questions. Um, and so Michael Perkins, he's got a question. He's with Frontline HR. And yeah, I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see it. The question is, hey, I'm sorry. But, but, I said, but, but no clear answer. Have you seen anything from the state on this? If an employer brings an employee back to work for reduced hours, can the employee still claim unemployment for the hours missed? And if they receive some state unemployment, will they be able to get the additional 600 under the CARE Act? And actually, I sat in on a webinar yesterday that answered this question, um, and I'm going to trust the source on that, is that, uh, and because it was the Department of Labor, the, the Alabama Department of Labor, as long as the reduced hours, the wages do not ex uh, come up to or exceed the 275 um, state payment, they can still claim. If they qualify for $10 on state, they get the 600 is that what because we do have you know we've had that question come up where people have more than one job for example and they've gotten they're returning to work at one job but they not they're not returning at the other or plants are starting to open back up but their hours are a lot a lot less so yeah we, we've been seeing that and that's been what the general um that's what I've, I've told them when those things have come up those questions have come up so have you seen any issues with, especially with those businesses that have been determined um, uh, essential businesses, such as grocery stores or, or other facilities where they're now capped at their capacity? Uh, what resources are, you know, what would you make, what recommendations would you make for those businesses to help ensure that those capacities are maintained um, at the cap or, and what, res you know, what, what, um, I'm sure they, they are concerned about legal issues wrapped around, well, if, you know, if I have a disgruntled client and they're refusing to leave or they're, um, you know, pushing their way in, what, what would you, like, you know, what, what protections do you see that that business has? You mean capped at their capacity, meaning the customer level has been reached of people that right. can come in line? Right. Um, what, what sort, well, you know, I think that, Obviously, if it, you can impose appropriate rules and regulations at your at, at your store, and if you post very clearly, you know what the capacities are, you know where people need to stand in order to stay six feet apart, or where they need to, you know, not get close to the cashier or, or other things. You can post those those reasonable rules and regulations in an attempt to comply with the Department of Health rules and if a customer does not comply with it you know you can you know nicely ask them to, to they need to leave then um i i think that it, there's nothing in the law that 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 prohibits the business from imposing those rules in order to comply with the department of health and you know being able to enforce them and i would kind of take it a, even a step further if you look at the stay at at, at home order it's not only obligation of the individuals, it's there's obligations imposed on the businesses that are that are open right now. So I think it's more of an obligation to make sure that you have rules in place and that you are enforcing them. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, let me say what I'm also seeing too is employees who feel that the employer is not appropriately enforcing the Department of Health regulations at their place of work are calling the Department of Public Health, complaining, and law enforcement is coming out to their to their store and inspecting to see that they are, you know, six feet apart or the, the reasonable amount that they can be apart of those those kind of things. So there's some risks that, you know, that in employers, you know, they want to they want to comply, but you, you I'm seeing where sometimes you know if they if they're not or if they have a disgruntled employee, the employees have have called in and alleged that they don't that they don't come comply. So for a a myriad of reasons, they will they will need to make sure that they you know do do that, even if the public should get angry. Um, another question that we've we've gotten from a couple of different places: If um, a business owner has an employee that has taken emergency paid sick leave, which you know, we know is is in addition to any other leave that's afforded to them, 
and is reimbursable to the employer with tax credits. However, if the employee um, requests this leave, what can the employer require from that employee to uh, be ensured this is a legitimate quarantine? So this is a really common question. Why do you ask that? The IRS has a FAQ out on this. And actually, I've got it right here. It's a very specific FA FAQ that the IRS answered what questions have you got to ask Josh what yeah. they have to what and there's actual a it, it's not much. They they don't the question has come up in a lot of different sort of capacities. What do I need to get and what if I don't believe them? What if they say they don't have they have a child at home and I know they've got a child at home, but that grandmother is there and they don't need me at home. How can I make them prove that they're and the FA and the guidelines don't really require that. All they require is the the name of the school age, the age of the school age child, um, and there's there's some language, a a a a a statement that they're that that they're they're unable, and if they're 14 years or older, um, a statement of why that they need to stay at home. But there's a specific language, and the IRS wants you know wants the employee to certified to those things and that's it there's no real proof that they have to give about it yeah and, and so no, do, no doctor certification or anything like that well now if we're talking about child care if we're talking about a physician certification for an employee being sick or being pulled out of work that's that's a whole that's that yes they do i'm speaking i, I kind of misspoke i'm speaking solely to the child care part that the employee comes in and says i need to stay to, to stay home because of a, a because of child care well, and, and also expanding upon that, uh, it's kind of a murky area right now in terms of dealing with that. Normally, when you're looking at family medical leave, yeah, that you can you can request a certification, you can uh, kind of basically get proof and or certification that they are that that they are suffering from a serious health condition. Now, under the expanded family medical leave, uh, it's a a little bit murky, uh, and again, we're dealing with a, a fairly uh, short statute uh, and or law. We have actually the, the the Department of Labor has issued rules and regulations, but even that is not filling in filling in all of the blanks. When you look at what the Department of Labor says, and it and it all depends on what type of leave that that person is seeking. You know, of course, uh, for the uh, for the paid sick leave, it's potentially up to six reasons as to why they could be eligible for that. Of course, when you're dealing with the extended family medical leave, you're dealing with the 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 one reason of of having a child uh, who is uh, who is uh, out of uh, school or that 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 a child of uh, school age or daycare age that that uh, that has closed? But in in looking in terms of the documentation, what the Department of, of, of Labor says, pretty much just getting the the worker's name, the date that the leave is requested for, the qualifying reason, mm -hmm. and then an oral and or written statement as to why they are unable to work. When you're talking in terms of a, a, a as to a healthcare professional taking them out of work and or diagnosing them with the, the the coronavirus, then in that situation you can ask for the name and address of the healthcare provider. Uh, and but it technically looking at the rules, it doesn't say anything about getting a actual certification. It just says that you can get the name and or address, and I guess potentially. Uh, which you know under HIPAA, you know, really e e assuming that you even call the the uh, the uh, healthcare provider, that they couldn't really confirm and or deny it anyway. So that's kind of somewhat of a murky area as to the uh, need for uh, for staying for for a child that is out of a school and or daycare. Uh, same thing, uh, but also the name of the son and or daughter, the name of the school and or daycare. And also, you have to represent that there is no other suitable person that could care for that child. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the complex issues with this is, let's say you're dealing with a child that is 16 years old. Well, that child could probably still take care of himself and or herself. The law doesn't care about that. The law, the, the, the law doesn't make any type of difference. But let's say that you have two parents, uh, that this is a two-parent household. Uh, the law doesn't really anticipate both parents being able to stay home and qualify to care to to take care of the one child. Uh, that pretty much under the regulations, I think that they're saying you have to pick and choose, and only one person can qualify in terms of that 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 type of a situation. 
Heather, I've got a sort of a cheat sheet form that I've sent to some of my clients to just sort of a generic. I'll email that to you and right. you feel free to give it out to anybody that asks. It kind of is the sheet of if you're sick, if your family member's sick, if you've got a school age child, here's that follows what the what the new what the rules are and check it's little boxes that you check. And I'll I'll send that to you if you think that will be helpful if anybody wants to email Heather for it. And we'll, if you don't mind, we'll put that on our COVID-19 page with our other resources, if that's okay, too. Um, so Shelly Hester has a question um, concerning how much information versus advice should an employer give employees who have questions about their options re in regards to emergency sick leave and the 12-week um, FMLA, emergency FMLA, uh, I guess, or unemployment. She's wanting to make sure that as an employer, by giving advice, she's not getting into any trouble putting the, the business at risk. Yeah, and that's a, a tough question. And Shelly, I know Shelly, she takes care of her 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 her, her staff and, and loves them and wants to make sure that they, you know, are taken care of. So I understand from when, from where that question is coming from. I, I, I think that there and, and the reason she's asking is because there's a fine line between helping and then, you know, giving advice and maybe the employee, you know, not following through in a way and it not in that not being the way that they they needed to 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 go there's a poster you know that that they that the um the dol has that you're supposed to post as it relates to ffcr leave you know i'm i i, I, I want to be helpful and help people but out to the extent you could just say here's what the information here's the, the here's what the poster is here's what my understanding is you know I, i'd be as helpful as i can without full fully giving on advice on you know what they need to do and what they don't need to do. It's hard because for unemployment, you know, often in order for the COVID-related unemployment to kick in, the employer did go in and file those claims and did engage in that. So there was some employer involvement that had to naturally happen as as part of, of that. But as far as is advising an employee of their rights, I'd get that poster out that the DOL wants you to put up and say here that's the best way to that's the way they want us to explain it so that's the way i'm going to explain it yeah and and i would echo that as well as i'll, I'll be very careful about giving any type of promises or, or or really any type of advice about that i would yeah i think the only thing that the employer is required to do is to to say whether or not they're eligible for either the paid sick leave or the or 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 the extended family medical leave beyond that as to what the that 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 person may be eligible for, I would be very careful about advising mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. That's um, not so fact specific. We've got so many clients in so many industries calling in with different questions because this employee has this specific fact pattern and this. And so that's why I, you know having sort of a worksheet of here's the answers that we need. Here's what employee you need to complete, and then if it's a question, you can call your uh, attorney. You can you can get some more information if you're un, un, if you're not sure. Absolutely. Right, right. Um, the next question: um, How does an employer respond to an employee who's on regular, currently on regular FMLA, and has filed for unemployment compensation? That's the first time I've heard that question too. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I would say generally that you can't have both. I mean, assuming that you're under uh, under general family medical leave, then that's going to be a situation where it's not coronavirus related. Or it, 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 it basically, uh, I would think in terms of a general family medical leave, you're probably not going to be eligible as to both. Because um, you're out of work for family medical leave, not because of a COVID yeah. related in order to get unemployment, COVID related is what it has to be. If you were already out on FMLA leave, I guess to the extent maybe that the COVID you would have returned if, but for some COVID related issue that might have come up, you know, during that leave, I guess that that could be a question, but I'm not sure if that's what's being asked. So in theory, the individuals that are applying for unemployment as a real as related to COVID the employers are still being asked to either file on their behalf or respond. Mm -hmm. And so if a, an employer responded that, no, this person has a job to return to this, I would think that that, that would disqualify from the employee when they made their application. That's what I'm, we're telling clients who 
who have people that are or that, that that aren't COVID related and they just left work, for example, that they're not those employers are not applying for the unemployment for the because they're they're open, for example, or they're in essential business and there's no they 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 haven't laid anybody off and so we've had that come up so the employer is not applying so when the employee applies alleging it is covid re related yes the employer is asked to respond to which they go it's not covid related and he has a job he or she right and what the, what the department's doing with that we haven't heard yet we that's been our advice to clients but we don't know how those are being handled. Well, obviously the sheer volume, it's gonna, there's gonna be some, mm -hmm. some things that, that slip through the cracks, but, um, you know, one of the calls that with the Department of Labor that I heard is that um, after this calms, there will be audits mm -hmm. um, to ensure that, that people weren't willfully unemployed, that people did not uh, attempt it. So, uh, you know, I, I would think that employee, it's gonna be on that employee if they, if they ask for something that they're not actually eligible for. Um, what about when you do have um, a COVID-19 positive employee and now they're stating that they're ready to return to work? Is there anything that the employer can require to um, to make sure that their their office, their staff safe for the return? I would just treat it, yeah. I mean, I would treat it under normal, you know, are you fit to return, get a fitness for, for duty, that's what I would do. And, and again, we're, you know, we're dealing with a law and re and regulations that don't expressly state as to what to do, but as to what Christian and I were just talking about, I, that I would probably defer and treat it almost like a normal family medical leave. And when someone's returning from a leave of absence under, uh, under family medical leave, you can ask for a certification uh, that uh, that they are able to return to work and assume the the uh, the duties of that 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 a physician. So I would think just to kind of protect yourself as the employer and also other other employees uh, that at a minimum that you know, you know that 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 I would make them go through th those steps first. Get a physician's their healthcare provider to send us that they are able to return to, 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 to work that just just to be safe that's what i would do that's what i would ask. wonderful well we're we've actually uh, gone past the 30 minutes that we've requested from you but i do want to open up the chat for or if you don't if you're not able to chat if you want to unmute yourself for one or two final questions if there are any uh while we're waiting for that i want to remind everybody that an email was sent to primary account holders today um, to get feedback on um, the road to re reopening for Etowah County. So if you haven't seen that yet, please um, check your spam folder, make sure you respond to that. That's um, information that Congressman Adderhold is looking for um, to help pattern how we're going to reopen business um, as a whole in the state. Um, our Congress has been asked by the governor to, put to, to help put together some actionable items. So please be sure you look for that. So one final call, any last questions? I, I do want to, we're moving into the next phase of this a little now where we see questions about bringing employees back, about spending the PPP money, um, you know, those recovery type things we're, we're starting to see. And so we're, we've got a, had a whole wave of issues on the front end and now we're, we're moving to another set. So you're so you want to think about things like about um, about that and about if you're going if you're needing to spend your PPP money on payroll, uh, whether you're increasing the payroll in order to to do that in some way, you're giving you know more you know giving extra money uh, to in um, to employees in some way. You know you you you. you, you if you bonus them, you want to look you want to go and look back to make sure that. So you're not potentially audited to make sure that it's not a family member that you that you're that you employ that you're giving the extra money to. If, if you can average what their pay is over the past six months, and and if you want to give them more than than what they 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 had 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 been paying, don't call it hazardous pay. Um, for anybody that's in healthcare or in any type of industry that might have hazard pay, because if they should have COVID or Corona and follow workers comp comp claim. 
if you call it hazard pay, then there's some type of implication that it could be related to work in some way. So you don't want to call it hazard pay. I'm seeing some clients do that. We, we don't want to call it hazard, uh, hazard pay. Um, so um, for whatever it's worth, like I said, we're, we're drinking from the fire hose here too, trying to just deal with all the different um, concerns that our, our clients in their worlds have. And then let me also stay, say as to this next phase, I think that's going to be, uh, first off, that there's a lot of questions come up from it that we're, that we are trying to figure out ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of liability, that's where the, the liability is going to be. When we start calling back the laid off mm -hmm. employees, uh, is it, uh, you know, that we have to do it in a way that it, that it doesn't invoke Title VII in terms mm -hmm. of type, some type of disparate treatment of disabled age, race, so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so just be very careful with that. And I think in terms of liability, the the front part, while the, that there were tons of questions with it, it was kind of at least a little bit more straightforward. This backside is going to be a lot of gray areas. And I would just encourage to make sure that you seek legal advice before making any, any of these major uh, decisions. That is, that's a really great point on, um, on a lot of the, the webinars I've said in that talk about phasing back in uh, to business that they're, the consideration is giving um, individuals with comorbidities or are high risk um, a continued um, stay at home or safer at home kind of um, uh, concept. And that can really get hairy, I'm sure, when you have those individuals as employees and, um, and they may want to come back to work and we're, you know. So yeah, that's, that's wonderful advice I hadn't thought about having to be very careful of. Um, Mike Perkins asked if we're hearing of any businesses that have received their PPP loans and is there a way to check status? I know I've heard from several businesses that have been awarded their PPPs as well as uh, just finally this week, a few businesses are getting um, deposits for the um, idle, the emergency um, advance. Uh, what about you guys? What are you hearing on the PPP loans? Yeah, they're starting to, to come in and those are why, that's why these questions are happening because they're rehiring is by June, by June 30, if you, you know, you've got your number of employees and your payroll back, back up, that's what that date is. So, so employers are trying to come up with a strategy now that the PPP is in, in order to, to rehire it. So we're, yes, we're seeing some, some, and there's ultimately going to be a disclosure of a list of all of the people or the, everybody that got the PPP. I haven't seen that list being disclosed yet. That was part of the law that they would have some disclosure on, on who that was. I don't know when that's going to happen or how it's ha how it's going to happen, but but yes, I, we're starting to see the PPP money hit, and that's why we're seeing some some rehires. But uh, you haven't you're not aware of any ability to check for an individual to check their status and as in, in, no. in a, as far as just checking with their lender that they're working with. My understanding is that what the, the lender will input once the lender inputs all the materials that you get a SBA loan number from the SBA at which point you got 10 days the lender has 10 days from the issuance of the SBA number in order to to uh, to, uh, to to close so I don't until you're issued an SBA number I think you're just sort of in you know waiting land well, not, not to invoke fear, but um, two different webinars that I was on today, uh, not that I do this all day, but I do this all day, um, it have estimated that the $349 billion cap will be likely reached this week. Um, so yeah. definitely more important than ever uh, for folks to reach out to their, their, uh, their representatives on the, the federal level and let them know that ad additional funds are needed. Yeah, and I, I think I saw that Todd Heinzman was on this call at some point in time. Yeah, too. yeah Todd got uh, been super instrumental and helpful for us as it relates to making sure that member compensation is appropriately um, claimed in these loans as well. Todd's sort of on the cutting edge of that. He actually helped, he helped us with, with that. So um, you want to make sure when you're applying for the PPP, the SBA just issued some guidance yesterday that Todd sent to me that kind of clarifies some of that. So um, a, a lot of the information we have about the PPP, we got from Todd Hines. <laughs> so I'll give credit where credit is due. <laughs> Wonderful. And can you tell me again what that, the what was the fee that you can be included? 
the member compensation, if you're a multi-member LLC and you've got member compensation, you pay self-employment tax on, there was an it was there was an issue with some lenders on whether as salary, as compensation that you you know have you know two and a half months worth, whether that member compensation can be included as right. part of your loan. Some banks were allowing it and some banks were um, uh, not, but some guidance came out um, from SBA uh, confirming that yes, member compensation um, can be included. But I, I'd encourage you to look at that as call Todd and you know get that SBA guide guidelines on that. That's been um, that that was really really helpful. Well, I think that wraps up all of our questions. Um, I cannot tell you how guys how much I appreciate you guys. I, I, if you bill on 15 minute increments, well, I'm I'm probably owe you some money by now because you only promised me 30. But I appreciate you so much. The fee for the for, for work for y'all is always the you know same. So uh, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for everybody for attending today. If you think of anything later, um, just email me some questions. We'll see if we can put together another chat in, in a couple of weeks. And um, I'm happy to. If this thing evolves, there's the issue. The issues are just gonna gonna change. Anything we can do to help. Wonderful, wonderful. We're all in it together. Uh, we're yeah. all here for each other. So thank you guys. Stay safe. Uh, can't you. wait to see your faces soon and in person. Thanks, so thanks everybody. Uh,